it's meant to hear here and um, I've been asked uh, by Shirley's meeting on the Michael and Prophecies page um, to discuss this book, um, The Second Messiah. Um, so I've now read this book and this is going to be my report on it. written by um, authors Christopher Knight and Robert Lomas and uh, they're quite also quite well known for a book called The Hiram Key which is about Freemasonry um, the authors are also Freemasons themselves so I thought the book was quite interesting in that it um, talks quite a lot about how um, Freemasonry is much older than people often make out that it actually goes back to um, sort of Jewish and before that Egyptian roots um, and it seems to say that the um, Freemasonry rituals, the true rituals are also um, traced back to Jesus's own family uh, members of the family such as uh, James the Just as he's known and that they secreted certain um, scrolls beneath the um, temple in Jerusalem and that the Knights Templar uh, were sort of partially founded to actually go and look for these scrolls a thousand years later under the temple in Jerusalem. I thought the sections on Rosalind Chapel and um, those sorts of aspects were really interesting it does then go on to talk about the tribe of Turin and it makes an assertion that um, Jack de Molay who was actually the head of the Knights Templar when um, the King of France rounded everybody up and um, burnt, burnt them at the stake effectively um, that he is actually the person whose image is on the tribe of Turin um, now it's an interesting idea and one of the things that really fits with that is uh, the dating, the carbon dating that was done in the late 1980s. And when this book was written, The Second Messiah, um, that carbon dating um, had only just been released. So that's a big plus in the hypothesis that uh, the strategy in was uh, Jacques de Molay. So I thought there was an awful lot here um, that wasn't really accurate when it came to the Shroud and um, especially in the light of recent evidence um, I think we can confidently say that this, um, this uh, Jacques de Molay hypothesis doesn't really add up. So I'm going to go through these points uh, one by one. So first of all the authors say there's no evidence of the shroud before um, the uh, the appearance in uh, Lyrae in France in about 1355 when uh, the widow of Geoffrey de Charnay who was a um, sort of middle class sort of knight um, suddenly appeared with it and put it on display. Now um, that's just simply not true because um, people know uh, that there are images of the shroud such as the pre-manuscript that appeared before then and that is uh, that was based around 1190 um, so you can see on the pre-manuscript sort of distinctive l-shaped holes and the kind of three to one herringbone weave um, that's present on the shroud itself you can see that on the pre-manuscript so um, that's number one um, there's also a, a, a theory that the shroud was actually a um, something called the Mendelian, which was actually just a folded cloth to a head that was present in uh, Turkey um, soon after the sort of death of Jesus, um, right until it was sort of seized by uh, Constantin uh, by people from Constantinople in about the nine uh, the nine hundreds um, now 
Uh, that was a proposal put forward by Ian Wilson, and uh, there's a whole long story as to um, why people are taking it on board. One of those reasons is that copies of the Mandelian that were taken at the time from people who saw the Mandelian um, show features such as like a furrowed brow and a forked beard, and uh, you know bruises on the cheek and things like that. Um, that were also present on the shroud. So people are now starting to realise that the um, the Mandelian was most likely to be have been the shroud uh, folded up, and in that case, we know exactly where it was um, all this time. So um, that's uh, that's that was strong sort of hypothesis that people are now accepting. Um, to back that up, um, the pollen studies that were done by Max Frey in the book The Second Messiah, um, they seem to discredit these pollen studies quite a lot um, because it doesn't. Uh, there's no mention of olives, uh, olive pollen. Now, um, olives uh, actually tend to um, grow most prominently a bit north of where uh, we would think the shroud was. So that's that might be a reason um but also olives are grow in various areas so that might be why max Frey wasn't um focusing on the olives but he did find um lots of pollen um that was native to that area and also um that was native to places in turkey now um that would fit with the mandelian hypothesis that ian wilson has put forward um, so that's uh, the the pollen studies are actually quite a big plus. Um, this book, uh, the Second Messiah, also says that uh, the three to one distinctive three to one herringbone weave um, was not around until uh, the me medieval Europe. Um, that's not true either. Some people uh, we know that that type of weave was expensive and had to be imported into somewhere like Jerusalem but it was available, it was something that was done. Um, so we do know that um, this type of cloth was present um, in first century Jerusalem. One of the things that the um, authors of The Second Messiah seem to be completely uh, ignoring is the presence of something called Sidar the Sidarium. Now that's quite um, understandable as not a lot of people know about the Sidarium of Oviedo. Now the Sidarium of Oviedo is just simply a kind of head cloth um, and uh, it's basically um, just got blood stains on it. Um, but what's so interesting is that from a forensic point of view, now these are scientists who are just simply looking at the sidarium cloth and comparing it to the shroud cloth, from a forensic point of view, um, the sidarium and the shroud, the blood stains absolutely match, as do the blood type. Um, now these are forensic scientists, they're just looking at does this cloth match that cloth? And they found, yes, they were both on the same person at the same time. Now that's really significant because the sidarium, we, we've known where the sidarium has been um, since the 6th century. There's really good records of that. Um, so if that's been on the same cloth, then the shroud has to have been older than 1355 which the authors of this book do not accept or even discuss so that's something that they've left out they put an awful lot of um of emphasis on the carbon dating of the shroud um that says that the earliest um it can have been in existence was 1290 um now we now know because of the work of Ray Rogers and uh, um, Sue uh, Sue Benford and Joseph Marino 
um, that the carbon dating of the shroud was actually inaccurate. This has now been put into um, peer-reviewed journals. It's been studied by chemists. The reason why it was inaccurate is because the sample was taken from a particular area of the shroud that was actually patched up in uh, the Middle Ages. Um, when Ray Rogers, who was the one of the original chemists who studied the Shroud of Turin in the late 1970s, when he actually looked at um, the one of the samples under a microscope, at first he just did not believe what Joe Marino and Sue Benford were saying. Um, so he decided to set out to dispute them. And when he looked um, at, under the microscope, he realised that they were correct. Um, the linen... Uh, was combined with cotton threads um, which had some sort of gluey substances substance to um, dye them to make them look old um, so um, we we now know that the um, carbon dating was inaccurate that's um, the word is spreading about that so um, this whole uh, thing with this uh, book is that um, it's based on carbon dating but um, <coughs> from recent data we now know not that that was a very unfortunate place to have taken the sample to test. Um, there's also a lot of forensic uh, detail um, about the person that was on the shroud that have been missed by the authors of this book. Um, one of those is that the person has been whipped by, um, horribly whipped by something that was called a Roman flagrum. And uh, this was a sort of um, three-pronged, um, well, sort of with leathers with three prongs at the end of it um, that were either made of, um, uh, with, usually made of bone or metal. And uh, this had sort of hooks that would hook into the skin, a particularly horrible way of whipping somebody. Now, um, why would somebody in, um, in the time of the Templars know about a Roman flagrum and go to all the trouble of finding it to talk to Jacques de Molay. Um So that that's the assertion of the um, of the uh, uh, of the authors that Jacques de Molay was tortured um, before he was killed, um, and he was tortured in the manner of uh, in the Gospels just to make a mockery of his beliefs. Um, that you know he was rejecting Christ, so um, they would have tortured him in the same way. Why would they have gone, or even known to have gone, into all the trouble to do that? That's just one of the sort of forensic details. Another one is that um, the uh, the nail that goes through the hand actually goes into a sort of an anatomical space and touches um, the medium nerve. We can see that on the Shred of Turin. Um, now this was not really known about in medieval art we can see that most people put the nail through the hand so why would somebody have um put the nail through the wrist now the authors actually suggest that the reason why there's a sort of contraction of the thumbs is because of dislocation of the thumbs but actually most forensic pathologists um, realised that um, the bruising in the median nerves, and this has been um, tested by um, actually putting nails through the hands of cadavers, um, but the bruising of the median nerve actually causes a contraction of the thumbs. Um, so that's why you see that on the Shroud of Turin. So that the assertion that the authors of the Second Messiah that the um, about the thumb was actually inaccurate as well. Um, so that's kind of just... Um, part of uh, the sort of forensic um, evidence that uh, you know they really don't know much about. They also really have not um, accounted for a lot of the detail of uh, the shroud um, such as why it's a holographic image. Um, their assertion is that um, Jacques de Molay after he was tortured was laid on a cloth um, why would they would have put it all over when he was still alive? Um, who knows? And he was actually put on a bed. Um, and uh, the heat from his body plus a lactic acid created this image. Um, now, uh, the, the, according to them, the cloth was put away for 50 years. And just like um, a flower in a page, um, over time uh, created this image. Um, 
it's not really fitting uh, with a lot of the features that you see on the shroud. Um, so it, it, it's, it's not really explaining all the features. So it's, it's quite a poor attempt, really, to um, explain uh, why it's holographic, you know, why all this detail is on there. Um, the actual image itself is not created by any substance itself. What it's created with is different gradations and concentrations of um, cellulose on the linen that's been aged very, very rapidly. So um, that's what it's uh, uh, actually caused by. It's not caused by a substance per se. And they haven't really explained that in the book. Um, so I think all in all, um, you know, it, it's a bit unlikely that it's going to be Jacques de Molay, although um, it fitted the original um, carbon dating result. Um, as we know, that's now been discredited. So I did enjoy the book. I think there's some interesting um, details in there. Uh, one of the things is that they discuss uh, one of the scrolls um, which is a copy of which is kept in Ghent University. I don't know if you can see that. And it's a, the Heavenly Jerusalem scroll. So this is um, a copy of something that's supposed to have been brought back from, um, from Jerusalem. And uh, what I found really interesting is this sort of pattern here. Okay, on top of these, of the sort of chevron with the circle. And I thought, I know where, where I've seen this before. And um, if this really is about, uh, you know, G information kept from Jesus' family, well, of course, this is the pattern that's actually above the so-called Jesus family tomb, um, which of you know, talked about in various lectures, uh, which is more details of that will be coming in the book, The Magdalene Prophecies. Um, so that's very intriguing, um, it, if that's really what's going on. Um, so there's lots of little details like that that I found interesting. Um, in the Jesus family tomb as well, um, which was found in the Tarpiet region of um, Jerusalem, and in the tomb were found sort of ossuaries, with names of various members of Jesus's family, um, like Maria for um, the mother Mary and uh, Mariam for possibly Mary Magdalene, um, and um, Jose, who's mentioned in the Bible as one of uh, Jesus's brothers, and possibly, possibly James. Um, you know, the James Ossery, the famous James Ossery is possibly found in there, um, or in there originally. So, um, there's, uh, possibly this is Jesus' family tomb, but, um, there's some unusual features for a tomb. I mean, lots of these tombs are found over, uh, around Jerusalem. One of those is a chevron that I've just pointed out. And another is when the tomb is found, was found, there was skull and crossbones, three of them on the floor of the tomb as you entered. Um, and when the tomb was uncovered in the 1980s, in fact, um, a woman found some kids kicking some of the skulls around and she alerted the authorities and allowed, and this allowed for an archaeological um, excavation to take place um, before building continued um, on, this, uh, on this newly discovered tomb. So it's now buried under a block of flats, basically. Um, but so, uh, so what's interesting, and uh, the guy that a guy that made a documentary about it, um, fairly recently with um, James Cameron, a guy called Sim Simka Yakubovich, is he made the connection between this sort of skull and crossbones, and the fact that in um, in an ossuary, which is the bone boxes. Um, you actually have the bones of the person with um, sort of uh, the cross femurs and also the skull on top. Now, um, there's no other tomb they've found that's got the skull and the femur. So the skull and femur on the floor like that. And he made the connection between the skull and cross bones and the Knights Templar. Now, um, we know that that's 
some of the symbol it became sort of the symbol of the pirates which um you know some people say it was knights templar escaping with their treasure and um so what this book um says which is quite interesting is that, and i didn't know this before this book is every freemason lodge has um a casket with a um femur bones uh with a skull and it also has a shroud so these are sort of really intriguing details and um, if the hypothesis is true that um, the Knights Templar and Freemasons contain um, over the years that they contained knowledge from the original family of Jesus or um, you know the, the fact that they've got symbols that may relate to um, the Jesus family tomb um, and therefore maybe they knew the whereabouts of the family tomb and who was buried there um these are possibilities they could of course have, have put that chevron symbol there, there themselves you know there's there's an awful lot here that we don't know about and uh, would need further investigation but it certainly is interesting and um so it was an interesting book overall but in terms of the hypothesis that jacques de molay um is uh was the image on the shroud um from a forensic and scientific point of view, um, I, it doesn't really add up that um, Jacques de Molay was the um, image of the shroud. And uh, when it comes to the science, the authors actually do quite a bad job um, of uh, reporting on the scientific aspects of the shroud. That uh, There's a huge amount that's been written about it. And they haven't really gone into detail about um, the, the forensic and scientific evidence, which is a shame. Um, and also um, details such as the sidereum and the fact that the um, carbon dating was wrong um, is actually something that's just come out in recent years. So, good book, but sorry, have to say, um, it doesn't really add up. It <laughs> doesn't mean that this is... Um, definitely Jesus that's on the shroud. That's not what I'm saying here. Um, I don't know who it is that's definitely on the shroud, but um, you know, it's uh, I, I don't think it's Jack Damale. Good attempt. Okay, so that is um, so that's the my review of the second Messiah. Um, so this is by Christopher Knight and Robert Lomas and uh, so more details to come in the book when it finally is, is written um, so lots of yummy things to look forward to um, so thank you Shirley Smeaton for your question and I hope that has answered it and uh, maybe some of you out there will also find this interesting and uh, see you soon bye <laughs>